Pick one word to characterize human existence. I do not hesitate. Consciousness. The inner sense of awareness. Sights, sounds, thoughts, feelings. The intimate presence of self-awareness. Aware of yourself, being yourself. That's the hard problem of consciousness. Internal sentience, our inner movie, the ultimate frontier of human exploration. I marvel at all the diverse ways in which consciousness can be examined. I know consciousness carries great import. Here's what I do not know. What is consciousness? I'm Robert Lawrence Kuhn, and Closer to Truth is my journey to find out. How to explore consciousness. Usually, philosophers talk to philosophers, brain scientists to brain scientists. Lots of interesting ideas, but no breakthroughs. Can we enlarge the discourse, view consciousness, including the hard problem of inner experience, through different conceptual filters, break boundaries, emancipate our thinking, how to start clean with minimum intellectual bias or baggage. Define consciousness, lay out the issues, go from there. I go to Cambridge, England, to meet a philosopher known for his tough-minded realism, former editor of the prestigious journal Mind, Simon Blackburn. Simon, I've been obsessed with consciousness my whole life. I did a doctorate in neurophysiology. How do you define consciousness? What's your unique approach to consciousness? Probably I wouldn't try and approach it by definition. I think that's going to be um, just a, a can of worms. Um, I'm not surprised that your life as a neurophysiologist didn't help. Leibniz said that if we could blow the brain up to the size of a mill and walk around inside it, <laughs> uh, we still wouldn't find consciousness. I mean, we're conscious of things in our experience of the world we describe in terms of consciousness. I think that the hard problem, as it's sometimes called, isn't actually what, for example, David Chalmers calls the hard problem. People think the hard problem is, gosh, there's a bit that physics misses out. There's the purple haze inside us. The uh, smell of the, cheese. The smell of cheese, the sight of the daffodils and so on. And science doesn't find that. Science can rummage around in the brain, but it's not going to find the smell of cheese or the sight of the daffodils. And that's supposed to generate a hard problem. Now, I think the really hard problem is trying to convince ourselves that there's no hard problem, <laughs> that this is, a, as it were, an artifact of a bad way of thinking. I think the philosopher who did the most to try to persuade us of that was Ludwig Wittgenstein, mm. a great Austrian philosopher who worked in Cambridge. And the central exhibit in his armory was the thing called the private language argument. You've got this epistemological problem. How do you know that other people have consciousness in the same way as you? But at least you think that you yourself are transparent to yourself. You know what it's like for you. Wittgenstein asked whether that was justifiable and saying, well, what about your own past? Maybe you're certain you're conscious now, but why are you so certain that you were conscious 10 minutes ago? And you say, well, I can remember it. But that's just another aspect of your present consciousness. <laughs> why should we suppose that that memory is veridical? Why should we suppose that we remember things as they were? If your consciousness is, as it were, completely independent of anything else, it's your own private possession, there's no reason to be certain of it. Why should you suppose that this is a, that you've got a, an adequate conception of how the world appeared to you five minutes ago? And Wittgenstein draws the conclusion that therefore consciousness isn't this gaseous internal thing which somehow you've got privileged access to, but which is problematic for everyone else. It's just as problematic for your own past. And once you see that, I think you might be jerked into a slightly more realistic way of thinking about consciousness. That sounds like a behaviorist analysis. I think behavior rules the roost here, but we've got to be very careful about 
how we think of it. We know about ourselves in rather special ways. You know whether you're enjoying something and you know you can conceal it, maybe not very successfully or wholly successfully. Uh, and so our mental lives, our cognitive lives, do to some extent float free of behavior. Supposing, for example, you're enjoying yourself, but it's important socially to conceal that fact. Um, you would be disposed to snigger or laugh or whatever it is, perhaps at somebody's misfortune or something. But you, uh, you, you maintain a straight face. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So your behavior doesn't express what you actually feel. Your feeling, though, might be nothing more than a disposition, here a disposition which you successfully masked, uh, to laugh or to snigger or to, um, to take pleasure in something forbidden and something you shouldn't be taking pleasure in. So we can certainly conceal our behaviors, but we have the disposition to behave. In that case, a more sophisticated kind of behaviorism, sometimes called functionalism, um, ought to be able to uh, free us, I think, from the idea of the private exemplar of consciousness, which is only problematically there in other people problematically there in chairs and tables for all we know. Uh, I think that's uh, that kind of hard problem you've got to get rid of. And as I say, the hard problem is getting rid of the hard problem. I thought I had one hard problem of consciousness, inner experience. Simon provides another. We can't be sure that other minds are conscious. What's more, he says, we can't even be sure that one minute ago, we ourselves were conscious. Must we become skeptics about consciousness? Resigned to not know anything about consciousness? Is this reality? Or is this philosophy making the problem worse? I should look beyond philosophy how to get at the substrate of consciousness. I go to the brain and the scientists who study it. I go to Oxford. I visit the British neuroscientist and writer, Susan Greenfield. Susan, what is it about consciousness that drives philosophers, scientists mm -hmm. absolutely crazy? I think that any academic, whether they're scientists, whether they're philosophers, you always start off by defining your terms. And as soon as you do that, then you run into the problem because how do you define consciousness? Would define flying, for example, as defying gravity. Or you could have referral to what we'd call a higher set. You could say a table is a piece of furniture. Love is an emotion. Now let's try either of those two strategies with consciousness. Consciousness is when you do what? You can be <laughs> sitting perfectly still, not doing anything, not saying anything. Yeah, you can still be conscious. So that operational definition doesn't work. What about the other strategy? Consciousness is a, a what? What's higher than that? Now, someone could get out of it and say, it's a property of the brain. But that's is what someone once called an anesthetic explanation. It's not an explanation at all. Right. What we really need to do is to be very picky. And whilst we can't say what consciousness is, we can certainly say what it is not. So what we have to do is distinguish Consciousness from unconsciousness. Um, so consciousness can be defined as what you lose when you go to sleep, let's say. Or perhaps a little bit more formally, you could say it's the inner subjective state that no one else can hack into. So, so let, let's then get to the core, which is this inner subjectivity. And that inner subjectivity can be expressed with lots of different content. So mm -hmm. The fundamental question is, is consciousness just the absolute sum of whatever the content is at the moment? Or is there something additional in consciousness that we are unaware of well, to make the inner subjectivity? Yeah, okay, you so, can't get away from no, this question. So it is the subjectivity that really, that really is the nub of the problem, because I think that's where science flounders. Science is all about measuring things. It's all about quantification. Now take consciousness. We've just said it's essentially, quintessentially, subjective, and what is there to quantify? So let's, let's just put that square on mm. because clearly it does posit that there's some little man or little woman inside your head, some fat controller, and obviously that's crazy. And it, the question I'd like to ask you back, if I said to you now, right, guess what? It's your lucky day. Today I woke up and I discovered how the brain generated consciousness. I, I now know how mm. it happens. Mm -hmm. What would you expect me to show you? 
Would you expect to see a brain scan, a formula? Would you expect you to suddenly feel like me? What? And until we can even articulate what kind of answer, right. how can we deliver it? Now, my own view with the subjectivity is there's two fallacies that I think we run up against, the thing fallacy and the readout fallacy. And the readout fallacy is simply, what does it read out to? The buck stops with the brain. Mm. And so when people talk about encoding, it implies that the code is decoded back. That's a fallacy because a code is something that's translated back again. What's right. it translated right. back to? Right. Yeah. So, right. so nothing is encoded. The word is wrong to use, yeah? The other is the thing. When people talk about consciousness, they reify consciousness as though it's something you can hold and deal with. And so, mm. you know, mm. when really it's a process, it's not a noun. You know, it's, it's something... It's a, it's, a, it's a verb, if you like. It's being conscious. Yeah. Yeah. And I think this is the other problem. So clearly, the, as a scientist, one's faced with this real problem of how do you deal with something which is an anathema to our trade, you know, which is subjective and which you can't measure. To make progress on consciousness, Susan says, first we need a clear definition of consciousness followed by specific instances or expressions of consciousness. What would then follow? Brain activities that correlate with consciousness. I go to Pasadena, California, to Caltech, to meet the neuroscientist who has pioneered the search for neural correlates of consciousness, Christoph Koch. Christoph, I would have never imagined that a professor at Caltech would be working on consciousness. Consciousness is the central aspect of my life. As um, René Descartes in, in the most famous deduction of Western philosophy said, essentially modern language, I'm co uh, I am con uh, conscious, therefore I am. So I think it, it's a legitimate subject of scientific inquiry. If we really want to have a comprehensive view of the universe, we have to account for consciousness, given its central aspects. And um, there has been a lot of progress over the last uh, two decades. Francis Crick, the co-discoverer of DNA, and uh, with whom I worked for 15 years, he was profoundly interested in consciousness. And I, we made a prediction. So a cortex is this sheet of neurons at the top of our brain. Mm. It's really essentially for our language and intelligence and perception and consciousness. It's divided into many different regions, perhaps at least 100 different regions. The best understood one is the one at the back of the brain. It's called primary visual cortex. It's a terminus for the optic nerve. So essentially the, the information, the visual information leaves our eyes and through a um, relay station and the thalamus goes to the, um, to the back of the head. And it's clearly involved in, in visual perception and I can stick you in a magnet. And when you're looking at something, this part of the brain lights up. But now you can ask a question, to what extent are the neurons in this part of the brain actually responsible for generating visual consciousness. And we hypothesized at the time, this was uh, 16 years ago, that, they're not res that they are not directly responsible for generating consciousness. So it turns out that the, the evidence seems to be in favor of that. Whether it's for the reasons we advocated, we, we don't know. But you can now do beautiful experiments. What you can do, you can put people in a magnet. It's a sort of a complicated experiment where the person is looking at something, but sometimes the person is seeing it and sometimes it's not seeing it. And what you can show that whether or not you attend to something makes a big difference to the neurons in primary visual cortex. But whether or not you consciously see it makes no difference to the, to, to the signal um, uh, in primary visual cortex. In other words, yes, primary visual cortex is involved in processing and taking in that visual information. And if you attend or not attend, makes a difference to the neurons there. But whether you're conscious or not doesn't seem to be the job of neurons in primary visual cortex. That seems to be this conscious experience I have when I see you or when I see this red of this table. That seems to be generated in a different part of the of, of, of cortex. So it seems then that consciousness is generated in only a small part of the brain? We don't know how small. I mean, it may turn out to be that um, the, the total part of the brain that's involved may be large. It may only be at any given point in time a small number of neurons. The general point is not all parts of your brain are equally important for consciousness. Mm -hmm, Some mm -hmm. parts of the brain have a much more privileged relationship with consciousness than others. And B, that you can make genuine conscious uh, progress on these ancient questions. You're not condemned for, you know, forever to sit around and do, do you know, philosophy. armchair. And do philosophy, that's correct. <laughs> We're learning what in the brain is necessary for consciousness. Because without this brain activity, consciousness is impossible. But is this brain activity sufficient for consciousness? Meaning that this brain activity, by itself, 
is or can generate consciousness? I remain with the question that haunts me, whether it's Christoph's brain circuits or some other neural mechanism. Can consciousness be explained by brain function alone? Am I reasoning in a circle, trying to explain consciousness by the brain, and answering the what is consciousness question by brain activity? How else to tackle consciousness? What about the development of consciousness? What can we learn from the emergence of consciousness in children? I go back to Oxford to meet a developmental psychologist from the University of Bristol, Bruce Hood. Bruce, uh, you talk to children. You do research on children. What can we learn about consciousness from children? We talk about consciousness usually as adults. And we make the assumptions that children are just little adults. But that's never really been true. Mm. And so I think in the work I do, we try to look at the emerging mind. But obviously, consciousness is part of the mind. I and mean, that's what we're most familiar with. So there are different types of consciousness. There's a consciousness in the moment. OK, that's the experience you're having right now as you're listening to me. It's fragmentary. It only lasts for a couple of seconds. And then it fades, OK, unless you really you actively try to rehearse it in your mind, and then it becomes a memory. But if I ask you to reflect upon things and bring into consciousness experiences, then that's drawing upon your personal history. Now, I don't really think it's plausible that a very young infant can have much of a personal history. That must be an emerging property. In fact, very few children have any memory before their second birthday. Hmm. But from about three years onwards, then you've got more little bits of script about things that happened in an event. I think you need to have a sense of self, okay? I think you need to have a sense of who you are there, as, a, as a protagonist, as a character, in order to weave together all these, these events into a meaningful story. You made the claim that even infants can have sensations, this first element of so-called consciousness. Yeah. How, how do you know that? Well, in the way that they respond, we can do experiments to see whether they habituate. That's this behavioral response that if you expose to a stimulus, you initially show this alerting reaction to it. But if you repeat the exposure, then your behavior eventually just sort of flattens out. So this is a way that you're actually learning things. But this notion of consciousness of who am I, where am I going, what do I do, these are obviously much more elaborated sort of notions of self and identity and consciousness which have to be But most people, when they talk about consciousness, it's always as an adult in its fully formed way, yeah. and we're trying to figure out how this happens. Yeah. But if we think about it maybe as you've done, and developmentally, mm. and you see these pieces coming together, maybe it's less mysterious. That's right. And of course, the way that you interpret things, of course, depends on the way that you see the world. Now, a child of two or three years of age typically has a very egocentric view of the world. They don't have a very elaborate notion of other people's perspectives. So if, if I was to ask you to tell me about an event that happened, you say, well, I did this, they did that, I thought this, and she thought that. So you've, you've already got a very elaborated, kind of sophisticated notion of other people's states of mind. So if you didn't have all that machinery in place, the way that you conceive the world would influence the way of what you remembered. So it must be changing, because we know that children don't perceive the, the world in the same way as adults. What's an example of a, of, of a description of, of, of an event at one age and another age, and you see the difference? There is a phenomenon called theory of mind. You know, it could be right. the case that uh, we, if, you, if you lack a theory of mind, then you don't have the capability to take another person's perspective, their mental perspective. Anyone who's ever you know, talked to a two or right. two, two and a half year old, they have this kind of very egocentric view of the yeah. world. Now, around about three to four years of age, there's this very marked transition where children start to understand that other people have different mental states. They, they acquire this theory of mind. Now, with that kind of a sudden transition, you can understand what other people are thinking, that they may have a false belief. They may uh, think something is true, but you know it's not. Uh, and then, of course, if you can read someone else's mind, theory of mind, then you can manipulate them, and you can anticipate what they might do mm. next. The more you understand the world around you, the more information you've got to organize it into meaningful stories and meaningful patterns. Mm -hmm. And that's what I think the consciousness is. Children are little labs of budding consciousness. It's remarkable to see three and four-year-olds develop this theory of mind 
recognize other mental states, take another person's perspective. Adults obviously have more mental elements with which to make a mind. But are these elements of consciousness specifically or of cognition generally? Cognition is the full spectrum of mental faculties, whereas consciousness is the subjective experience of watching our inner mental movie with our mind's inside eye. But is consciousness wholly solitary? Can consciousness go beyond the self? Can consciousness be rooted in social interactions? I go to Tallahassee, Florida State University, to meet social psychologist Roy Baumeister. Roy, the concept of consciousness has uh, obsessed me for, for decades. Uh, normally, I talk to philosophers and neuroscientists with a theologian thrown in there once in a while. But I've not talked to a social scientist before. Have I been erring? I think uh, the way we've approached it, the, uh, the, the people who've dealt with it, the philosophers, as you say, the neuroscientists, the cognitive people, uh, they're missing something. They tend to think almost like if I were building a robot, what would I need to mm -hmm. add consciousness for? What is its function there? Uh, what I think is crucial and that uh, is missing is that uh, consciousness probably evolved for social reasons, to enable us to relate to each other. Um, there are many very creative behavioral studies debating what do we need consciousness for, showing that, well, you can get some behavior, this or that behavior, when people are not conscious. We used to think you needed to be conscious for everything. That's, that's clearly not true anymore. But nobody's been able to have a conversation without being conscious. What really set our species off on its unique path, the, the, the trait that defines Finds us as human was not intelligence. The first thing looks like it was communication, uh, and communication started with uh, gesture rather than uh, than speech. Um, some of the animals uh, developed the capacity to infer what each other was doing from how they moved their uh, their arms. It's like Mother Nature said, hey, that could really go somewhere. Mm -hmm. In our species, we started uh, communicating to ourselves. That, I think, is what consciousness for, because consciousness is a place where uh, you can build uh, um, sequences of thought, so we start communicating much better. Uh, it's a place where you can represent the mental states of others. Uh, lots of, there's lots of learning, learning everywhere in nature, uh, but not teaching, because teaching you have to know that I know something that you mm -hmm. don't, and I want to tell you that. Uh, so it's, it means me knowing that you have a mind like mine, except that it doesn't have this information. And so, let me put it this way. Sooner or later, every theory of consciousness bumps up against the, this problem. Thoughts in the mind can cause behavior. Why do those thoughts have to be conscious? What's the benefit? I can think, don't put my hand in the fire, and then I don't put my hand in the fire, that's good for me, okay? But uh, why does that have to be conscious? Unconscious thoughts could do that as well. A robot can say, don't put hand in the fire. Mm -hmm. So that's a very hard problem, and a lot of uh, good theories f fail on there. But. Uh, very easy to make an evolutionary case for if I can tell others my thoughts. So I can tell my children, don't put your hands in the fire. Mm -hmm. Then my reproductive fitness is improved, I pass on my genes. Uh, so the value of consciousness becomes much easier to establish once you establish an interpersonal dimension than when you're trying to do it one mind at a time. We can't really imagine what it's like to have consciousness without culture. Uh, and, and it's a deep question of even whether you, whether you would have consciousness because you need language, for example, to represent things that are not there. You can't get language by yourself. You have to have that from your culture. So your ability to think about things away from the here and now. Most animals just live in the here and now, respond to what they see uh, and smell and so forth. We can respond to things far beyond the uh, here and now. And consciousness is, is crucial for that. Consciousness enables us to think beyond the, the present and thus to act in very different ways. For centuries, the territory of consciousness was patrolled by philosophers who defended opposing positions with vigor, precision, and occasional fury. Then neuroscientists arrived taking the high ground of explanation with the new weapons of science. But still, the mystery of consciousness remains unsolved. How on earth can inner experience literally be brain sparks and chemicals? 
So others moved in, developmental psychologists, social psychologists. Here's a current status report. Consciousness battles reveal uncertainty and ambiguity. And that's the excitement. Surely the complexity and richness of human consciousness requires psychological development and social interaction. But unless we can explain the hard problem of inner awareness, we cannot fully answer the simple question, what is consciousness? And we are no closer to truth. For complete interviews and for further information, please visit closertotruth.com.